Ebony, get back. The movie opens in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 2011, where we see a boy named Andre Jackson drawing something on the wall of his new home. He calls out to his mother, Ebony, and shows her his drawing. Ebony asks him to come help her make dinner and leaves there. And the scene shifts to a church where we see Ebony's mother, Alberta, who is battling cancer. Later, while Ebony is having dinner with her mother, Alberta, and her three children, her eldest teenage son, Nate, preteen daughter, Shante, and young son, Andre. Alberta asks why she wouldn't let her take Andre to church. Ebony replies that it's because he didn't want to go, and she doesn't like forcing him to do things he doesn't want to do. Alberta then complains about there being too much garlic in the food, to which Ebony responds that part of the agreement when Alberta moved in was that she wouldn't have to hear any comments about how she runs her household. Andre asks for more milk, and Ebony reminds him that he shouldn't have had any in the first place, since he's lactose intolerant. Andre retorts that she's never taken him to a doctor to confirm that, and she's just being cheap. Alberta laughs at this, which prompts Ebony to slap Andre and warn him that it's the last time he'll speak like that in her house. The slap causes Andre's lip to bleed, and when Ebony gets up to check on him, Alberta angrily stands as well. But Ebony tells her not to start on her, saying it hasn't happened in three weeks. Later, we see Shanti texting her dad, asking when he is coming home and telling him that their mom has been acting crazy lately. And here it's revealed that Ebony has a history of alcohol abuse. Meanwhile, a fly lands on Ebony's glasses and she blows it away. However, she then notices a swarm of flies emerging from the basement door. Ebony quickly opens the door, tries to push the flies back inside and shuts it tightly. On the other hand, Andre wakes up and goes downstairs, where he opens the fridge and starts drinking milk straight from the carton. And as he does, a bird suddenly hits the window. Andre steps outside of the house to check on the bird, and the scene cuts here. The next day, Ebony receives a call from the bank informing her that after three months of missed payments, the company's policy requires them to repossess her car. While on the call, Ebony discovers a bottle of vodka and some cash hidden in Nate's closet. She confronts Nate, who denies using it and claims he was hiding it from her. As he walks away, she notices blood on Shanti's shirt, and Shanti explains that the corner boys are responsible. Furious, Ebony confronts the boys and strikes one of them, warning him never to touch her family again. When Ebony returns home, we see Andre talking to someone unseen, who claims to live there as well, and says he is his brother. Ebony notices the flies again and interrupts Andre, asking him what she told him about talking to himself before telling him to get back inside the house. Later, Ebony tells Shanti that they might wait until her father gets back to have her birthday party. Shanti asks, so no party? To which Ebony suggests they could just have a small celebration, like a nice dinner. Shanti asks, what about my new phone? To which Ebony replies that her phone isn't going anywhere. Upset, Shanti storms off, saying she's tired of being broke, and Andre chimes in, agreeing with her. That night, Ebony is startled to find the basement door open and quickly closes it. The next day, Alberta visits the hospital for her treatment and flirts with a doctor named Melvin, who suggests they meet outside to exchange numbers. As Alberta is leaving, the receptionist stops her and informs her that her last two months of bills are still unpaid. Alberta replies that she will call Medicaid on Monday to sort it out, but the receptionist tells her that they stopped accepting Medicaid over a year ago. Surprised, Alberta asks who has been covering her payments, to which the receptionist reveals that Ebony has been paying, so she wouldn't have to switch clinics. That night, when Ebony returns home, Alberta tells her that the hospital informed her that she has been making her payments to which Ebony responds that they shouldn't have shared that information. Alberta says she doesn't know what to say, to which Ebony tells her she doesn't need to say anything, and then walks away. Later, Ebony dreams of a man descending into the basement, 
and suddenly, he appears in front of her, causing her to wake up, and she sees the door closing. She goes downstairs, thinking someone may have broken into the house, and finds the basement doors open again. She shuts the door, but the foul smell from inside nearly makes her vomit. As she turns around, she is startled to see Nate standing there. She tells him that she is okay, but Nate asks where his money is. Ebony asks where he got all that money and warns him that if he's involved in selling drugs, she'll use his bat on him. Nate explains that his father sends him money orders, which he cashed to save up to leave her. Nate asks for his money again, and when Ebony slaps him, he pushes her back and says he hates her. Realizing his mistake, he tries to make amends, but as Ebony moves to confront him, Andre rushes to stop her, stumbling over the bat and falling. Later, Ebony tells Nate not to leave, insisting that they need him and that she is really trying. The next day, the pest control discovers a dead cat in the basement, and Ebony tells him to call the landlord, arguing that they've just moved in, to which the technician warns that without payment, the cat will go back down into the basement. Ebony says she doesn't have the money, but Nate offers to pay and goes inside to get it. As he takes out the money, he notices a car pulling up outside. Cynthia, Ebony's DCS officer, visits their house and asks Ebony, why didn't she inform her office about the move? To which Ebony responds that she wasn't aware she had to. Cynthia then mentions that she visited the kids' school and found their reports to be concerning. She asks Shante about a bruise on her arm, and Shanti replies that she doesn't remember how it happened, and that it was there when she woke up. Cynthia then asks Andre why he is hunched over, and he explains that it's from the playground. Cynthia tells the kids that she needs to speak with their mother alone, and as they are leaving, Cynthia gives her card to Shanti, asking her to call her anytime. As Shanti leaves, Ebony tells Cynthia that she has nothing to do with the bruises. Cynthia responds that she's not here to make her life harder, but is focused on the welfare of the children. She asks her if she has been drinking, to which Ebony replies that she drinks occasionally, like everyone else. Cynthia then mentions that their father made allegations in court about drug use, drinking, and neglect in the home, to which Ebony argues that he made those claims to gain custody of the kids. Cynthia tells Ebony that she can retain custody of her children as long as she monitors the situation closely, to which Ebony responds that she already knows what the situation is, because she's living it. Cynthia emphasizes that the kids need her to be clear-headed and that they need to know she is putting them first. Now, as Cynthia leaves, Ebony and Alberta notice an unknown woman outside their house, looking a bit scared. Later that night, they celebrate Shanti's birthday, and during the celebration, Ebony hears a sound coming from the basement door. She goes to check and finds Andre banging his head against the door. She asks him what he's doing there, but realizing that he isn't fully conscious, she wakes him up. She brings him out of the basement and asks why he was there, to which he explains that he was talking to Trey, who lives in the hole downstairs and sometimes stays in his closet. Noticing that he is burning, she brings him to his room and puts an ice pack on his forehead. Later, Ebony drinks too much and starts dancing provocatively with some men, which Alberta and Ebony's friend Asia doesn't like at all. Asia begins to leave the party, and when Ebony tries to stop her, Asia responds that they have a job to get to tomorrow. Ebony returns only to find that everyone is gone, and Andre is standing in a corner. She tells him to go to bed now, to which he says he is scared, but she asks him what is going on with him and pushes him to go to upstairs. Later, Ebony wakes up to the sound of banging and assumes her children are causing it. However, the children hear the noises coming from the closet. Frustrated, Ebony rushes to their room in anger. At the same time, Alberta is saying goodbye to Melvin, and as he leaves, she hears Nate screaming for help. Alberta rushes into the children's room and finds a huge hole in the wall with Ebony sitting on the floor with a baseball bat and the children are huddled together in a corner, clearly frightened. She asks Shanti what happened, and Shanti explains that she woke up on the floor with their mom yelling. Alberta then asks Ebony what she did, but Andre interjects, saying that she threw them against the wall. Ebony denies it, and Alberta firmly tells her to get out of the room. The next day, on the way to their school, Andre notices the same woman following them. Later, during class, Nate suddenly begins to laugh, which angers the teacher. However, Nate continues laughing uncontrollably and falls out of his chair. Meanwhile, in his classroom, Andre starts pottying. In another class, 
Shanti says something to her teacher that shocks him, and he notices she is bleeding. Andre's teacher tries to get him to stop, but he throws his potty at her. Ebony receives a call from an unknown number, and her expression quickly turns to worry. The scene shifts to the hospital, where Shanti and Nate are admitted for checkups. And during Andre's evaluation, he is shown a series of pictures, and when a picture of a crow appears, he says, that's Trey. Later, Ebony is informed that her children's reports look good, and that the psychological evaluations found nothing unusual. However, Ebony responds that her son ate his own feces today, prompting the doctor to ask if the children have been under any psychological stress recently. Ebony explains that it's their third home in a year. Their father is in Iraq, and they don't know when he'll be coming home. Alberta tells Ebony to lower her voice, reminding her that the doctor is trying to help as best she can. But Ebony insists she won't be pushed out of the hospital and demands more tests, refusing to leave until the doctor tells her what's happening with her kids. Alberta gets up and tells Ebony she won't allow her to speak to the doctor that way. And the doctor says, why don't they talk about the bruises? As they leave, Ebony asks Alberta why she doesn't support her. Alberta explains that she does support her, but maybe the doctor is right. She adds that sometimes other people are right, and you don't always get answers to everything in the world. Alberta then asks what happened last night, saying that she saw she beat the kids. Ebony replies that if she wasn't old and sick, she'd knock her out right now. Alberta warns that if she hits the kids again, she'll turn her in herself, to which Ebony says she never turned her in saying she is the same. That evening, Ebony receives a call from the hospital informing her of an outstanding balance. She hangs up and Alberta says, the Lord saved me and he can save you too, Ebony retorts. Then tell God to take the cancer out of your body because I can't pay for it. And she tries to pull the crucifix off the wall, but Alberta stops her. Now when Ebony goes to the bathroom, she is shocked to see Nate trying to drown Andre in the bathtub. She struggles to pull Nate away and calls Alberta for help. And after a tense moment, she manages to get Nate off of Andre, saving him. Alberta rushes in, and Nate, shaken, says he doesn't know what happened to him and asks for help. The next day, Cynthia visits again, and Ebony tells her it's not a good time, but Cynthia forcefully enters the house. She tells Ebony she can't keep her kids out of school, to which Ebony responds that the house is making them sick. She explains that she can feel it and hear things, and whatever it is, it's infecting her kids. Cynthia mentions she talked to the doctor at the hospital, and Ebony snaps that the doctor didn't even look at her kids properly and was judging her. Cynthia says the doctor believes the kids are behaving this way because they think that's what Ebony wants, to which Ebony tells her that Andre was in the closet, speaking a language she had never heard before, and said a little boy told him to kill himself. Cynthia says she's tired of her excuses and insists on seeing the kids, to which Ebony accuses her of walking into her house with a judgmental attitude, saying maybe if she had kids, she'd understand. Cynthia reveals that she did have a son, Julian, who died when he was seven. She had turned her back for just two seconds, and when she turned back around, a car had hit her baby. She says that when she sees mothers like Ebony taking their kids for granted, it makes her sick. Ebony insists she isn't doing anything to harm her kids, but Cynthia demands to see them. Alberta comes downstairs, holding a bat, and seeing this, Cynthia decides to leave, shouting to stop hitting the kids. Ebony follows her, denying that she hits them, and Alberta warns her to calm down or they'll lose the children. After Cynthia leaves, Alberta approaches the woman who has been taking pictures and accuses her of working with Cynthia, prompting the woman to quickly drive away. Alberta goes to her church for help and explains that the kids don't remember anything after coming out of their trances, and she believes there is something evil in their home that is feeding on her family. However, she is told that their church does not handle those kinds of situations and that she should try seeking help at another church. Meanwhile, the woman confronts Ebony and tells her that her children are ill and that there is an evil spirit in her house. She introduces herself as Bernice and reveals that she is an apostle and goes wherever God sends her. Ebony asks, so Jesus sent you here to save us? To which Bernice responds that she needed to confirm her suspicions before intervening. She shows Ebony a photo of Janelle and Aman who lived in the house 20 years ago. She explains that it was their first home and that they were very proud of it, 
They had moved there from Memphis in 93 and were members of her church. When Ebony asks what happened to them, Bernice explains that Janelle and Afman took their son to several doctors, but none of them could find anything wrong with him. That's when they turned to her, so she had to perform a deliverance to cast out the demon. Ebony asks, like in the movie The Exorcist? To which Bernice replies that she doesn't perform exorcisms because she doesn't need an intercessor, as Jesus Christ is her intercessor. She says that when one acts with the power and authority of Jesus Christ, just touching a body can make a demon flee. She adds that, as soon as she walked into that house, her nose was filled with the smell of death, and she had never encountered such a powerful evil before. She was unable to match its strength, and it laughed at her. And ultimately, she lost the boy. When Ebony asks what she means, Bernice admits she doesn't know what happened in the house after that. In a flashback, we see Janelle killing Avman one night by severing his head. Afterward, she starts laughing maniacally, only to break down crying when she realizes what she has done. Just then, their daughter comes there, and Janelle rushes towards her to kill her. Bernice tells Ebony that Janelle strangled the girl and then hanged herself. Meanwhile, Alberta experiences a series of paranormal activities in the house before she is attacked by an entity. Ebony asks for the name of the boy who died, and Bernice reveals it was Trey. Ebony then tells her that her son has an imaginary friend named Trey, to which Bernice responds, that's not a friend, that's the devil. She warns Ebony that the demon wants her son, saying when the deliverance of Trey failed, the demon waited in that house for another innocent child to come along. Ebony, frustrated, tells Bernice to stop, asking if she knows how crazy she sounds. She asks her to stay away from her family and stop following them. As Ebony begins to leave, Bernice stops her, insisting that she is going to need her. When Ebony returns home, she finds the fire alarm off and Alberta's crucifix on the wall aflame. And to her shock, she discovers Alberta's lifeless body lying on the floor. Andre then comes downstairs and asks, what happened to grandma? To which Ebony replies, you tell me. Just then, she hears Shanti scream and rushes to check on her. Ebony flees with her children and Shanti tells her that she called Cynthia because someone needs to help them now that grandma is gone. Hearing this, Ebony says, I did everything you wanted and asks, do you want me to go to jail? Suddenly, Andre begins hitting his head against the seat and Ebony tells him to stop, but he responds, it's all your fault that her mother is dead. Ebony becomes terrified as she sees a demonic look in his eyes, causing her to nearly collide with a truck. Panicking, she stops the car and runs to a nearby diner for help, where a man approaches her, urging her to calm down and asks what's wrong. She frantically tells him, something is killing my kids. The man rushes outside to check on the children and finds them sleeping peacefully. We then see Ebony with a psychiatrist, who asks if, in the past six months, she has ever thought about harming herself or her children. Ebony replies, no. The psychiatrist then inquires if she currently uses drugs or alcohol, to which Ebony admits to having used alcohol a few weeks ago, but denies using drugs. The psychiatrist points out that this isn't entirely true, as they conducted a blood test when she arrived at the hospital. The psychiatrist then asks if familiar surroundings ever seem strange, threatening, or unreal to her, and if she has heard unusual sounds, such as banging or chirping in her ears to which Ebony says yes. Later, Cynthia visits Ebony and informs her that they are sending her children to a church foster care. Ebony rushes to stop them but finds the door locked. The next day, Ebony visits Bernice and asks what the demon wants, to which Bernice replies that it wants her baby and to take everyone in the house. She explains that the demon preys on the weak, and right now, she is vulnerable, but they are about to make her strong. Meanwhile, Cynthia sees Andre, and the nurse informs her that he has been growling and hissing all night. And a little while ago, he was speaking in another language. After some time, Andre stops, gets up, and gives her a chilling, deadly look. On the other hand, Ebony tells Bernice that she tried talking to God when she was little. She experienced bad things growing up and asked God to make them stop, but nothing changed. Bernice explains that faith isn't transactional. She tells Ebony that their efforts aren't just about keeping her son safe from a demon. It's also about understanding that God loves her. Meanwhile, 
Cynthia approaches Andre, who says he likes watching you sleep. And when she asks who he's referring to, he replies, Julian. Cynthia inquires if his mother mentioned she had a son, to which Andre responds that his mother is dead and that God is dead too. When Cynthia asks why he would say that, he replies that he is not Andre. And when she asks who he is, he demands to be unstrapped to reveal his identity. Cynthia insists that's not how it works. But suddenly, the straps release on their own, and he jumps out of bed, and Cynthia, terrified, watches in horror as he climbs backward up the wall. Later, Ebony visits the hospital disguised as a nurse and enters Andre's room. And as she tries to take him away, he suddenly opens his eyes, startling her. However, he soon loses consciousness again. Bernice and Ebony bring Andre back to their home, where Bernice warns Ebony to remember that whatever the demon says, she should not listen. The demon will exploit her emotions and appear as people she loves. Bernice then begins the deliverance ritual and instructs Ebony to stand back. As she sprinkles holy water on Andre, the demon starts screaming and soon takes on the form of Alberta, pleading with Ebony to remove the chains from her. Bernice continues the ritual, and the demon tells her that he is going to kill her. Meanwhile, we see Nate and Shanti also getting possessed, and begin manifesting supernatural injuries. As Bernice continues, the demon begins hitting its head against the seat, and suddenly it breaks the chains and falls down the chair. He then slides into a corner and laughs at them, immediately followed by the house shaking violently. Ebony and Bernice struggle to maintain their composure, and Bernice tells Ebony to lock the door and go upstairs until it's over. Bernice then confronts the demon, which taunts her, saying that she promised she could save the boy's soul, but now he is trapped with them. The demon then gets up and vanishes right in front of her eyes. An unseen entity then strangles her before slamming her against a wall. It then lifts her again, and the scene shifts to the hospital, where we see Shanti bleeding and Nate harming himself, both under possession. Meanwhile, when Ebony comes downstairs, she is shocked to find Bernice unconscious and Andre sitting beside her. Ebony demands the demon leave her son, but Andre asks what is happening to him before vanishing once more. Confused, Ebony looks around and Bernice, in her fading state, tells her that she is dying. Bernice confides that she doubted herself and was overcome with fear. Ebony then enters the basement looking for Andre, where she finds him, and he asks her if can she help him. However, as she approaches him, he sees the holy water in her hands and turns demonic. Ebony throws holy water on him, causing his body to burn and falls on his knees. This makes the demon furious and he lunges at her, causing her to fall, and then it begins to hit her. He then drags her away and tries to strangle her, and then she takes her form. It tells her that he gotta kill all of them, but suddenly she finds that the demon has disappeared and she is all alone. She looks around, but suddenly the demon appears and slams her down. It then possesses her and controls her body, causing her to injure herself. Ebony maintains her composure and cries out Jesus' name, enraging the demon, and it attempts to kill her by strangling her. As Ebony begins to lose consciousness, happy memories of her life with her children flash before her eyes, and the scene abruptly cuts out. As the demon begins to leave, believing Ebony is dead, it is shocked to see her standing. The demon taunts her, saying that nobody loves her, not even her mother, to which Ebony responds that her mother loved her and that she is a child of God. She rebukes the demon in the name of Jesus, and the demon pleads with her to stop and not do this to them, despite its attempts to possess her. Ebony continues her prayers, and eventually, the demon catches fire and is dragged into hell. After a few days, Cynthia visits Ebony and informs her that she has spoken with her boss, and they have a battle ahead. Ebony is determined to get them back and asks how the kids are doing, to which Cynthia replies that they don't remember what happened. Ebony then tells her that she is returning to Philadelphia to stay with her aunt until she can find a house for herself and the kids. Six months later, the juvenile court granted a petition from the Department of Children's Services. Ebony finally got her children back. On their way back to Philadelphia, Ebony tells Nate that she has been in touch with their dad and that they are going to try and work things out. Thanks for watching.
If you enjoyed the chills, hit that like button, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you never miss a scare. Until next time, stay spooky.